Once one of America's top Republicans, Lawrence King is serving a 15-year prison sentence for a multi-million dollar fraud. But financial crime is only half the story. This is the true story of Lawrence King. It is the story of a cancer at the heart of America and of its continuing cover-up at the highest level. One man is attempting to uncover the full story. John DeCamp is among the most highly decorated Vietnam veterans. A former Republican state senator in Lincoln, Nebraska, he is now a lawyer fighting the legacy of Lawrence King's abuse of power. It's a web of intrigue that starts in our holy of holies, Boytown, Nebraska, one of the most respected institutions in the United States, and spreads out like a spider web to Washington, D.C., right up to the steps of the nation's capital, the steps of the White House, involves some of the most respected and powerful and richest businessmen in this United States of America. And the centerpiece of the entire web is the use of children for sex and drug dealing and drug couriers, the compromising of politicians, the compromising of businessmen, but worst of all, the corruption of key institutions of government that have the duty and responsibility to make sure these things never happen. For John DeCamp, the trail starts in a unique town just outside Omaha. World-famed Boys Town is in the news again. Made famous by an Oscar-winning film, Boys Town is America's favorite children's charity. It was founded in 1917 by a Catholic priest, Father Flanagan. Father Flanagan, the saddest spectacle in our social life is a neglected, unwanted, and unloved boy who has become a serious problem in our society. The well, town was started to be a home for orphans. It was after World War I. And uh, since then, society has changed, and the problems of boys have changed. And so now, uh, it's a question of taking care of uh, homeless, uh, abandoned, neglected, uh, abused boys and now girls also. Boys Town has been granted the privileges of an incorporated town, a Catholic diocese, and a school district for 500 children. Boys Town has cash reserves of $500 million, but still raises up to $35 million annually, solicited from the public by begging letters and promotional videos. I'm Father Dal Peter, caretaker of Father Flanagan Stream and the executive director of Boys Town. Does Boys Town really exist, people ask me? You bet it does. Located in the heartland of America, Boys Town youth have come from many backgrounds and locales. As they graduate, they shall seek new adventures and head for different places. But always, they shall carry with them the spirit of Boys Town. If you'd like to help Boys Town, Send your tax-deductible gift to Father Val Peter, Boys Town, Nebraska, 68010. Boys Town, for me, was the first thing I ever heard of when you think of institutions that you respect. Believe it or not, I was there for a while when I was a young boy. When an institution like that gets contaminated, then you better, if you got any decency at all, uh, do something about it, or, or at least get it cleared up. John DeCamp lays the blame for the contamination of Boys Town of the one-time leader of the National Black Republican Council, Larry King. Larry King was the fastest rising black star in the entire Republican Party of the United States during all of the 1980s. And he was also one of the most evil individuals in this country in terms of being a dealer of children in terms of being a thief, 40 million that they documented he stole, and in terms of using and compromising and corrupting one after another politicians. The base for his network was the Franklin Federal Credit Union, a people's bank in Omaha, Nebraska. Larry King was its general manager. Thank you. 
This is especially an exciting day for me. Mr. King was a very charismatic person. When he came to the credit union, he was brought in because the credit union was actually failing. He did everything to build the credit union. King called to the leaders of Omaha's wealthy business district. Banks, industry, and charities placed millions of dollars in King's hands. From 1979, Larry King developed close commercial ties to Boys Town, and Boys Town youngsters were sent to work for his companies. Boys Town had quite a few accounts at Franklin Credit Union. Those were considered very valuable accounts. They were handled exclusively by the bookkeeping department. But on the average of once a month or once every two months, we always seem to incorporate a person from Boys Town. But King used Boys Town not just as a source of young boys for his business. He prostituted them at sex and drug orgies. Paul Bonassi was a victim of King's abuse. He was also sent by King to lure Boys Town youngsters off campus. We used to just drive around and go up to where the home was and we used to do some of the uh, scavenger hunts with picking up from the kids. You know, just kind of win their confidence, become friends with them for a while. Start inviting them to the parties. The kids were 10 years old or older. In 1986, King's plundering of Boys Town was reported by staff to its chief executive, Father Val Peter. Subsequent testimony proves that he carried out his own investigation but that King's victims refused to talk to him. Monsignor Huff now blames himself for Boys Town's association with Larry King. Well, in retrospect, I uh, regret having any association with uh, uh, Larry King. Uh, had I known it at the time, it would never have happened. Could you understand why a very detailed report from a social worker employed at Boys Town identifying children and identifying their alleged abusers. Never saw the light of day, nothing happened with that. No, I can understand that because I know that had been, I wouldn't put up with that, but uh, is that something like that happen? I don't know. Nebraska has a very clear statute that child abuse allegations should be reported to authorities. They shouldn't be reported to the principal of a school, director of a facility, they should be reported directly to either Child Protective Services or law enforcement. And so Larry King remained free to feed his pedophilic parties with child victims. But in 1988, a routine review brought King's involvement with Boys Town Youth to the attention of Nebraska's State Foster Care Review Board. And the information presented to the Foster Care Review Board, either via the telephone reports, the personal reports, or the reports we reviewed, uh, Larry King's name was consistently present as someone that the youth were making allegations against. I would say we handed over at least a foot high um, amount of material to authorities, and nothing happened. Omaha police now accept that Larry King may have been abusing children. Good morning, Roberta. But its most senior officer claims the evidence was not conclusive. It is certainly possible that Mr. King was involved in illegal acts with children. If there was sufficient evidence, evidence of those types of allegations, he would have been prosecuted by the county attorney's office. For me, it was very clear that the case was not investigated and not pursued because of the alleged perpetrators. Those perpetrators named by the children were some of the richest and most influential citizens in positions of power in the state. Men prominent in industry, politics, the media, even the police. We can only name the ringleaders. Besides Larry King, they were department store millionaire Alan Baer and the celebrity columnist of Omaha's only newspaper, the World Herald, Peter Citron. With the judicial system apparently paralyzed, Larry King spent Franklin's money on courting political influence. Ten million dollars went on jewelry, flowers, and private planes. He cultivated contacts in the inner circles of Ronald Reagan's White House. 
At his palatial homes, three in Omaha and one in Washington, D.C., he held extravagant parties for the influential and powerful. His lavish spending bought him a protected life. Larry King was constantly heralded, cheered, applauded in the news media as the great businessman that's helping the poor people, the black community of Omaha. But King's extravagance attracted the attention of the Internal Revenue Service. As a result, on April the 11th, 1988, the Franklin Credit Union was raided and closed by the FBI. King was arrested and the federal investigation showed he had stolen $40 million from Franklin. Documents we possess reveal the FBI interviewed many of the victims of Larry King's sex ring, but no action was taken. In November 1988, Nebraska's state government set up a parallel investigation into Larry King. A legislative committee was formed. Its chairman was the Republican head of the Nebraska's banking committee, corn farmer and state senator, Lawrence Schmidt. Immediately, anonymous threats began. I received a phone call on the floor of the legislature. The caller did not identify himself, but he said, Lauren, you do not want to have an investigation of the Franklin Federal Credit Union. And I asked who I was speaking to, and he said, that doesn't matter, um, but you shouldn't have that investigation. And I said, well, why not? He said, it will reach to the highest levels of the Republican Party. And we're both good Republicans. Undeterred, the committee began their investigations, and the money trail led quickly to the original allegations of child abuse. Carolyn Stitt was one of the first to testify. The night before we testified before the legislative committee, I did receive a phone call at home that said, if you speak, you won't live to regret it. To protect the inquiry, Schmidt's committee hired special legal counsel and full-time professional investigators, Gary Caradori and Karen Ormiston. I said, uh, we do not want you to bring to the committee rumors, uh, innuendos, nothing that cannot be backed up with facts. I said, bring to the committee that which we can take to a prosecutor. The investigators found new victims of King's pedophile network, many on the streets of Omaha. The picture they built up was of a large ring of rich and powerful pedophiles, many named the same men as those involved with the Boys Town cases three years earlier. They were telling us about prominent people in Omaha and elsewhere that were abusing children at, uh, at parties. The prominent citizens' uh, names um, that originally came up uh, were uh, a concern to me because I knew many of those individuals and uh, I very practically was shocked to have those names show up on the list. To provide the committee with hard evidence, the investigators recorded their new witnesses on videotape. Paul Bernassi had been the victim of abuse since he was eight. He was present at many of Larry King's sex parties. Caridori traced him to the county jail. He had been convicted of fondling his young cousin. Who were some of these people that would come to these parties? Media personality Peter Citron procured some of his victims from Boys Town. The kids he liked were mainly around the age of uh, probably about 8 and 13. It was mainly uh, fondly and oral sex with them. He did have some anal sex, but he usually did that with the older kids. The parties involved ever more sadistic abuse. Whenever you were tied up, were, was there anybody else present other than uh, you, Peter Citron? Yes. Who was that? Alan Bear. Millionaire Alan Bear hosted parties for a large number of sadistic pedophiles. 
Paul Bernassi suffered at their hands. Okay. Troy Bonner was found by the investigators and his videotaped testimony taken under oath. I was shocked when I walked in. There was a, a kid, I would say, about 15 years old, out in the middle of the room. Uh, one guy was standing in front of him. He was bent over, and the other guy was, like, reaching under him, playing with his nipples, while a guy whom Jeff told me was a police officer shoving beads up his rectum. The police officer was shoving beads up his rectum? Yes. Bonner named Alan Bear as the man who introduced him to the sex parties. Alan Bear was a sick fuck. Didn't care, you know, wanted sex, nasty, you know, I don't even know if you can call it sex. Everything, I mean, from just, you know, touching to fruit, squash, you know, huge squash, you know, that big around, you know, stuck into you, into your ass, you know. Uh, heat heat things, hot things, you know, poked at you and stuck in you. But the center of the child sex ring was Larry King. Larry King was the same kind of sick fuck Alan Bear was, except Larry King was more violent, uh, more sure of himself, you know. I got those scars on my own one night at a party where Larry King, you know, wanted to see how strong a man we were or something, you know, and have us put your arms together and you need to light cigarettes and as soon as you get burning, you just drop them down between your arms and, you know, let it, let it burn. You know, and they never stand there naked and touch each other by holding our arms together and burn cigarettes for You know, it's on film someplace. And then they filmed it, burning, you know. I mean, I would, you know, see it fuck a 10-year-old boy in the ass, you know, until he bled and, you know, just pull out and stop and, you know, push him down, you know, and, you know, and then go out and, you know, meet with decent people. King would also provide underage girls for abuse. Alicia Owen told the investigators she was 15 when she attended her first party introduced by a Boys Town boy. Caridori discovered her in jail where she was serving a sentence for passing bad checks. I met some guys there that were from Boys Town. And it was at that party that I met Larry King. At the time that I met Larry King, I did not know him. But he was Larry King. I, I had met him. It was the first time I'd ever met him. Larry King and Alan Bear frequently hosted the child sex parties in penthouse apartments at the Twin Towers luxury block in Omaha. Um, a lot of it was um, me handcuffed with my hands behind my head um, and my feet tied and, and doing different things. Um, what do you mean? Uh, sometimes there'd be a guy straddling over my face. Okay. Most of the time, Larry King took pictures quite a bit during that time. I know it's difficult. I don't know. Okay. And I think I could say no. Okay. But I know. Okay. And you know, Alicia, you're a victim. <laughs> and uh, with a young age. Let's go off camera for a minute. We were appalled, appalled. I don't even know if it comes across on the video, the way it came across to us in, in person. It was, it was incredible. It's incredible what these kids went through, I think. Larry King was also here. He came in and uh, we drank and did cocaine. I didn't do much. I 
he turned me on to it, but it seemed good. Drugs was a, a strong part of uh, how they got control of some of the kids because that's what some of the kids were there to get. They would uh, do the sexual uh, acts and then be provided with uh, cocaine or uh, whatever type of drug they wanted. Heroin, you know, I don't, I don't know, but that was my, my drug of choice. You know, till this day, I remained an addict. You know. And those of us that didn't like to be involved and didn't want to be involved were threatened. Kurt? Oh, yes, uh, uh, and who do these Larry King. Um, Larry King personally did? And I think he did. And when they threatened, you know, that I can go find somebody that will kill you, and it will kill your family, um, you won't tell anybody. Larry King was I would say the center of transporting the children around the country. The, the airplanes were usually um, in his name, at least in his name. They were paid for by Larry King. So he met them in Pasadena? Met who in Pasadena? We know Larry King was there. There was... Um, Three boys that I had seen at one of the receptions at the French Confederate were there, and I was positive they were both ten boys. Almost positive. Um, they were there. You mean graduates of Boy Town? Well, not present. I mean, they were present because they were young. Well, how would they get away so long? I have no idea. Okay. Boys Town uh, came up frequently during the investigation, but we found it very difficult to get information about Boys Town. I was not able to find any information on my visit there, and uh, Mr. Caridori could not get information either. Boys Town today remains unwilling to discuss its involvement with Larry King. We were banned from filming at Boys Town, and its public affairs officer refused any interviews. I would uh, have to give you a flat no. I'm just going to tell you at this point that uh, we will not participate with you. We have no interest in talking to you folks. It's something that we don't even care to delve into. By the spring of 1990, the Nebraska State Committee was convinced by the evidence of an organized child abuse ring. Its chairman, Lawrence Schmidt, sought the advice of his lawyer, John DeCamp. On his advice, Schmidt turned over all the sworn evidence to the FBI. But immediately, the videotape testimony was leaked to a hostile local media. The media immediately started discrediting the witnesses. They were, um, the witnesses came across in the media, in the Omaha World Herald, especially, as the criminals. The last three victim witnesses were demolished by the press, particularly the Omaha World Herald. The paper never looked for information that would support any of the allegations. The whole purpose of the stories was to, was to destroy any credibility that these youth may have. I've heard that people said that Gary Caridori coached me and uh, that he told me what to say, but the fact was I didn't meet Gary Caridori until way after I'd already talked to the Omaha police about the abuse and had named all the same people. Paul Bernassi maintains that neither the FBI nor the Omaha police took his allegations seriously. And they didn't ask me very much about Larry King or, Al uh, or even uh, Alan Bear at all. They treated the allegations that I made about the, about the people who abused me almost like a joke. The stories were of such significance that the investigators first wanted to prove the accuracy of the stories as they said about the investigation of the three, initially three, and then a fourth person were telling the stories, as the investigation developed, it became obvious to the investigators that the information was not accurate, but in fact, it was an entire conspiracy of, of allegations, none of which had any truth to them. I was very disappointed with the way uh, the FBI and law enforcement treated the victims. They, in fact, uh, turned them into the 
offenders, so to speak. And instead of taking the evidence that was delivered to them by the victims and interrogating the persons whom the victims identified, uh, they seemed to bear down and try to get the victims to change their story. It seemed to the investigators that the establishment of Omaha was closing ranks. Then Troy Bonner was brought in for questioning by the FBI. The FBI's attitude was, you know, just no. This, this, these kind of things don't happen. From the first interview when I went, you know, and realized they don't believe a fucking thing I'm saying, you know, I mean, they are, I mean, they, they were just appalled, but I realized what that, that look in their eye was back then. It was fear. It was fear of them, you know. I mean, I had witnessed, you know, firsthand things that would, you know, destroy this city. You know, people at the position, you know what I mean? It's not going to be believed, believed, they said. It will not be believed. You will be found guilty of perjury. And you, I mean, they weren't telling me maybe. You know, they were saying, uh-uh. It's, you're not, it, there's no way. You're going, you go on with the story, you're going to jail. I mean, that was said to me direct. Troy Bonner agreed to withdraw his videotaped testimony. The FBI used Troy in an attempt to persuade fellow witness Alicia Owen into abandoning her evidence about Larry King's nationwide network of powerful pedophiles. We have obtained the recording of the phone call made by the FBI on March the 9th, 1990. It is significant evidence for John DeCamp. This is Special Agent Michael F. Mott. The following will be a consensually recorded telephone call between Troy Boner and Alicia Owen. Hello? Hello. Hi. Hey, what's going on? I'd like to ask you that. No, talk to me. No, you talk to me. I don't understand why you're lying. Why are you lying? What are you talking about? That's what I'm asking you. You're calling me why I'm why I'm lying? Yeah. You can talk to this whole thing, Alicia. You're full of shit. Either tell me what's going on. You're full of shit. Hey, look. Who do you have listening on the phone? I have nobody listening to me. I'm listening to you, and I'm hoping you'd give me some fucking answers. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what kind of game you're playing. I'm not trying to play a game. I'm not going to go to jail for you. And that's what's going to happen. Why would you go to jail? Jail for telling the truth? No, jail for lying. What have you lied about? I haven't lied. Okay, but why are you... Listen, shut up. Listen to me. You're not out here being talked to him every day. The pressure's kind of hard. You literally have to have bricks for brains to take on the FBI in this country. And that's exactly what you'd have to do to do this properly. They now, in my opinion, in my investigation, are the architects of the cover-up. We asked the FBI in Omaha for an interview about its investigation of the Franklin scandal. Larry Holmquist for the FBI here. We feel it would it would be inappropriate for us to comment. We work this with the Omaha Police Department. We just don't feel it would be appropriate for us to make comments. As the investigators sought out new witnesses, they found themselves under constant threat. Gary was threatened several times. His, his vehicles were tampered with. I would think whoever tampered with them, it was a scare tactic because it was so obvious that they were being tampered with. Gary got, he was, it was one piece of evidence I know he got that he was, that he even said he, he got one step ahead of him this time. He told us about this book. It was, it was like addresses, telephone numbers, names. He said if, if, they, uh, if they knew he had it, they'd kill him. On July the 11th, 1990, Gary Caradori and his eight-year-old son, AJ, were flying home from Chicago in his light aircraft. They had watched the All-Star baseball game, and Caradori had been pursuing new leads. Investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board are in Harold Cameron's cornfield, trying to determine what caused this private plane to crash, killing its two occupants. bodies of Gary Caradori and eight-year-old AJ were found in the wreckage. 
National Transportation Safety Board investigators say wreckage from the crash is apparently strewn over a three-quarter to one-mile long stretch in this field. The, the fact that the wreckage is scattered over a, a large area certainly demonstrates that it did break up in flight. The exact mechanism of breakup yet is still unknown. The federal investigation was never able to discover what tore the plane apart. There are things missing from the plane. His briefcase is missing. I think the plane was sabotaged. There's no doubt in my mind. Within 24 hours of the tragedy, all Caradori's records were impounded by the FBI. Gary's widow, Sandy, is still unable to come to terms with her loss. As a mother, I don't want to ever think that somebody murdered my child. I love my husband. But I think if you'd ever talk to any parent, be it mother or father, who's ever lost a child, I mean, the worst thing that you can think of is that somebody would want to murder a child. I really feel that somebody killed my brother. And uh, inside me, I, I know somebody killed my brother. If somebody could help us out somewhere, somebody knows something. And uh, may, uh, may God help those who did that to him and his family. The effect of Gary's crash on the investigation I think, in effect, put an end to any, anybody else coming forward. There are many victims. We knew of more. There are more. They're still out there. They're afraid to come forward. That's when I was finished, because I figured out if they murdered Gary and his son, there was nothing that would stop them. There was no piece of paper. There was nothing we could come up with that was going to get anything done. Gary Caradori's death pricked Troy Bonner's conscience. He promised Sandy that he would tell Senator Schmidt's committee about the FBI's pressure which led him to lie. I set the record straight. I was, you know, going to do it. Uh, and would, you know, the truth would come out, you know, and somebody would be ha held accountable for his death. And then at the funeral I had seen, you know, FBI guys, you know, and they, they looked at me. You know, I was supposed to meet Senator Obet and Schmidt for lunch after the funeral. And, uh, you know, that's when I decided, I told my mom, you know, look, we're not going to do the lunch. We're going to hightail it out of Lincoln now. Troy Bonner claims that pressure from the FBI and with the assistance of the county attorney's office in Omaha led him to swear a new statement claiming that he and Alicia Owen had concocted the entire child abuse story. He told this story to a grand jury form to bring any charges. On July the 23rd, 1990, the grand jury issued a bizarre and contradictory report. It indicted Larry King for fraud and embezzlement and ruled that he had paid young men for sex but dismissed allegations about his sex ring. It indicted Alan Baer for the serious offense of pandering for sex but rejected evidence linking him to King or to Citroen, whom it noted had been convicted of separate child molestation charges. It accepted that Troy, Alicia, and Paul Bonassi had been abused, but not by the people they identified. And for refusing to withdraw her evidence, it charged Alicia Owen with perjury. Lauren Schmidt's legislative committee issued a report denouncing the grand jury. Schmidt acknowledges that the system failed both the victims and him. I had, I think, as distinguished a record as anyone could put together in 24 years. I was told that would be curtailed, and it was. I was told I'd have financial problems, and I did. The message was not lost on most politicians in Nebraska. I think the message that uh, was delivered was if any legislative committee ever tries to conduct a thorough investigation again, the same thing will happen. It has shaken my faith in the institutions of government. It used to be a 
firm believer that that uh, the system would work, and uh, that people who did things wrong would be punished. And uh, we discovered uh, victims who claimed to have been abused and who the grand jury acknowledged had been abused. But they did not try to find out who had abused those individuals. Instead, uh, they convicted Alicia Owen of perjury. Indefensible from my point of view. The trial took place in July 1991. Troy Bonner testified that the child abuse story had been an invention. As a result, Alicia Owen was sentenced to between 9 and 25 years in prison. I can't find a case in the history of this country where some kid got sentenced to 25 or 30 years in prison or something like this. If you were going to pick a, a, what I call a tell sign, something that says something fishy about the whole thing, it was in the sentencing itself. For some reason, they had to send a signal to every kid who was a potential witness. It's my opinion again. A signal so loud and clear, if you dare to come forward, if you dare to talk, watch what happens. Alan Bear was fined $500 after pleading no contest to a reduced charge of aiding and abetting prostitution. Peter Citron served two years of a three to eight year sentence. Thanks to Troy Bonner's lies, Larry King never faced child sex charges. For the $40 million fraud, he was given a 15 year sentence, 10 years left on Alicia Owen. I feel really sick. I should be taken out and shot for doing that. And if that was to happen, I, I would go with it. John DeCamp, former state senator and Vietnam veteran, is now the only man fighting to help Larry King victim. He is the lawyer trying to overturn Alicia Owen's conviction and to expose the cover-up. I live in Nebraska. Hell, I was born here, raised here. I have four kids growing up here. Like it or not, it, it's my heritage, you know? Well, if it's a dirty cesspool that I gotta live in or look back on that I left, that ain't good. The real cost, if I were gonna say to my family, has been the fear and intimidation has put in some of the kids. A couple of the kids are really, really frightened and uh, really had some sleeping problems over, you know, here, this or that. So that, that's been the real concern I've had. John has received anonymous threats and has turned for advice to his friend and one-time boss, former head of the CIA, William Colby. Uh, old Bill Colby told me better than anything. The, the one thing the bad people can't afford is publicity and, and knocking you off right now or doing something obvious to one of your kids uh, would bring them more trouble than it's worth. I said, you have to consider the possibility of some danger to not only your reputation, but to your person. I mean, there are, people do react rather violently to some kinds of charges, or particularly if they're true, there's more apt to be a negative reaction than if they're false. If they're false charges, then they can be reacted to in a normal way, by a libel suit or whatever. But uh, a true, if there's truth in it, there can be a danger in that situation. We've seen that happen in other cases. John arranges to meet Troy Bonner, the young man he sees as the key to the cover-up. He's in great danger. The reason is he carries the secret, so to speak. He served his purpose for the FBI and others by committing the lies that put the seal on the cover-up. He knows that Troy's evidence will be crucial to Alicia Owen's case, and Troy wants to tell the truth, despite very real fears. Uh, my fears are that, you know, I'm not going to be believed again. It's just, you know, going to be a whole other kind of exploitation like it was last time. You know, and afraid that that's going to happen, or, you know, I might end up dead, or a loved one might end up dead. Troy has an overriding reason for putting the record straight. Maybe somebody has a better idea. I want is to go forward and, and have something done so that all those other kids who a lot worse things have happened to can come forward and see that action can be taken. You have to, if you want to protect yourself and your life and your family's life, both now and particularly in the future. 
is to use the institutions of government that have been set up to protect you and make them work. That means you go into federal court, you go after the people that have done this cover-up, and you expose it so there's no longer any percentage on their part in eliminating you because the secret's out. Yeah, that's why we're here today, to, 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 to let it out. John's advice to Troy to tell the truth in court puts him at risk of prosecution by the county attorney's office. Potentially, they could decide to charge him with perjury because now he is telling that they forced me to lie. I did lie at Alicia's trial. I did lie before the grand jury. I did it because the authorities were forcing me to do it and I was scared for my family. Potentially, they could charge him with perjury this time. Troy's appearance in court will keep Alicia Owen out of prison. She's on bail while DeCamp appeals against her perjury conviction. As her hearing approaches, vital new evidence emerges. Alicia claimed that some of Troy's videotaped testimony was withheld from the grand jury which indicted her. The tapes that were shown to the grand jury had been edited. Everything that matched Troy's statement was shown that matched mine, I know it's, which it's edited out. And I think maybe one of the things we want to do is show the judge specifically how, where these, you know, little five-minute segments of, look, this tape says this, and then show him it isn't in this tape, and this is the tape the grand jury saw. I'm going to attempt to get these tapes, and we'll see what happens next. But to obtain the tapes, the camp must approach some of the very officials he has accused in court of being involved in the cover-up the county attorney's office, which ran the grand jury. In the good old Alicia Owen case, 127-194, I'm trying to get the evidence, the tapes and the transcripts of Troy and Danny, Troy, uh, Troy Boner. Yeah, they're up there. Yeah. Look at the county attorneys. They have all the bills up there. Oh. Uh, Robert, uh, let me guess, Robert Siegler has them. Robert Siegler is the prosecuting attorney trying to send Alicia Owen back to prison. After lengthy negotiations, the camp emerges with the tapes the grand jury never saw. And it was uh, $4,000, about $4,000 Okay, and what airline? Uh, uh, In more than two hours of taped testimony, Troy details trips across America on behalf of Larry King and Alan Baer, trips for drug deals and sex. It corroborates Alicia's evidence. For John DeCamp, this is the proof of the King's sex ring for which he has been waiting. Here it is so to speak, the smoking gun that they could go out and verify, the corroboration. In other words, the linkage to King that was denied. Cover-up. Organized, planned, deliberate cover-up. The courthouse, Wahoo, Nebraska. The hearing begins. Alicia Owen is ready to testify. So is Paul Bonassi, but there is no sign of Troy Bonner. The camp discovers that Robert Siegler has sent the young man a subpoena. Fearing arrest for perjury, Troy has gone into hiding. The camp is without his most vital witness. In court, Alicia's case is adjourned. The county attorney's office begins to search for Troy Bonner. But county attorney Siegler won't say why. Every victim witness who stepped forward in any way or even was a potential witness that somebody heard about has either been killed put in jail under some theory or other, terrified or run out of the state, discredited every perpetrator, every perpetrator, even the convicted ones, 
have been treated as conquering heroes. Peter Citron lives in the same house where he abused many of his young victims. Alan Baer lives in the most exclusive part of Omaha. He recently bought a downtown shopping mall. Many of the other abusers named by the children have risen within Nebraska's state government and legal system and within the Republican Party. Obviously, the FBI was protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of old pedophiles having improper relations with little boys. They were protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of drug peddlers. They were protecting, in my opinion, they were protecting some very prominent politicians, some very powerful and wealthy individuals associated with those politicians and the political system, up to and including the highest political people in this entire country. In search of the men who protected Larry King, John DeCamp goes to Washington to investigate King's connections in the Republican Party and on Capitol Hill. Paul Bonassi provides him with the evidence that Larry King threw child sex parties here at his rented $5,000 a month Washington house. I was about 14, about 1981. At first it was about three or four times the first year. After that it was about once a month. Some of the parties when they started off were straight political type parties, with no sex. And then when some of the men had left, some of the politicians had left, the ones that had planned on engaging in some type of sexual activity, uh, that would come after the party. Some of the kids would be held downstairs in some of the rooms where if they acted up or if they started freaking out because of the drugs that they were on, they'd put them in a room that they couldn't get out of. Locking in. What kind of drugs? Anything you wanted. Cocaine, uh, heroin, speedballs. You're telling uh, me those speed. things were at these parties where you had Larry King and prominent politicians? Yes. Yeah. Were they readily available to anybody at the party? At the after parties, they were readily available for anybody. Beforehand, they did it more uh, upstairs than they did anywhere else, and it was kind of in the back room. Were any attempts ever made that you know of to, uh, to expose this situation? As far as I know, nothing's ever been done, and most of the people that were in there had already been, I guess you say, compromised. King's partner was Washington lobbyist Craig Spence. Spence took youngsters, including Bonassi, on private midnight tours of the White House. So you were in the White House then? Yeah. And how, how did you gain access? Well, I came down with uh, Larry King, but Craig Spence was the one that arranged the trip for us, and it was kind of a, a gift for our services that we were doing. How many times were you on this kind of a trip? I came to it on two times. Two times? And were you used for sex on those occasions? None until after we left. After you left the White House? Yes. What time of night? It was usually around uh, midnight. Benson, Larry King had a couple of groups. One was called Bodies by God, and they had the Call Boys. And there was another group that was started by Larry King, which was called the Golden Boys, which was kids that were usually under the age of approximately 10. Spencer's Call Boy Network was investigated in 1989 by reporter Paul Rodriguez of the Washington Times. We had uncovered a series of allegations from some minors, and that led me to a callboy operation. It sure fits with, you know, this boy Paul Benassi, and he tells the tale of being brought to the White House on occasion, kind of as a reward for the kids. Craig Spencer's dad committed suicide. He had advanced stages of AIDS. He was an AIDS carrier and he killed himself. This was the thing that always bothered me. They claimed it was the largest uh, male prostitution ring in the city that they've ever, ever had uncovered. It was a million dollars a year minimum. Yeah. And yet they only prosecuted the operator, uh, Henry Vinson, and three of his lieutenants, as it were. 
-hmm. They never went after any of the Johns or the clients. This operation claimed to have clients that ran from the White House to the Capitol Hill to the State House to the churches and within the media. Exactly what Paul describes as the people he was with. And a lot of the stuff led there, but we couldn't quite nail it at all cases because, again, to accuse someone of high yeah. stature, you've got to be very careful. I understand. We were able to do it through the mother load who provided us credit card receipts and canceled checks and then um, lists of the clients. The prosecutors knew all this stuff. There was approximately 20,000 documents they had. They sealed the entire record by court order. And we have tried, to, we've attempted on several occasions to unseal that. And we've been told it will be a cold day in hell before those records ever get unsealed. And it makes me wonder what's in those records. Yeah. John DeCamp believes that the legal system is still being subverted and that the people protected are still at the heart of the American establishment. He hopes that this program will expose a serious miscarriage of justice, but the opposition is formidable. It's beyond belief that Arguably, the most powerful person in the world, the President of the United States, in the form of Richard Nixon, could not prevent the investigation of Watergate, or that President Reagan could not prevent the investigation of Iran-Contra, and yet somehow this group of unnamed, unknown, anonymous individuals in Omaha, Nebraska have such power they can control and protect all of these people from being investigated. Those allegations are ridiculous. Well, first of all, Nixon did cover up Watergate, number one. Bush did cover up Iran-Contra, at least officially. And Omaha has successfully covered up this situation. In each case, it was the press that exposed the problem. It wasn't institutions of government. They had been corrupted. They had been compromised. They were the ones doing the cover-up. The Attorney General is now involved. The camp's evidence has been passed by William Colby to a senior lawyer in the Justice Department. He did say that the Attorney General's office would be very sensitive to any charges of abuse of children, that this was a matter of considerable priority to the department, that this sort of thing not take place, and that they would assign an officer to look into the case. For John de Camp, the story of Larry King's corrupt empire holds a dire warning for all America. If you can control about three or four key elements, you can totally own a state. You can make right wrong. You can make truth falsehood, falsehood truth. If you control the media, if you control the Justice Department, if you control the police, you own the system.